We must act radically. The Jews must clear out of Europe. But if they refuse to go voluntarily, I see no other solution but extermination. When I think about it, I realize I'm extraordinarily humane. The Second World War is long over, but the nightmare world of Adolf Hitler still represents the ultimate in evil. His legacy was 40 million dead, including the attempted annihilation of an entire race. But just how did one man lead the world to the brink of destruction? It's convenient to dismiss Hitler as something alien, a monstrous aberration, somehow different from the rest of us. But the uncomfortable fact remains that he was human. Despite being the most written about and filmed individual in history, he remains a shadowy figure, lost amid flickering newsreel footage, overshadowed by the horror he unleashed. Idolized and adored by millions, Hitler inspired unwavering loyalty. Winston Churchill described him as this wicked man, the repository and embodiment of soul-destroying hatred. But to his devoted followers, he was a brooding, mythical hero, wrapped in a cloak of righteous vengeance. So what power allowed this man to unleash the greatest mass slaughter in human history? Then, als unsere Partei gerade sieben Mann hoch war, sprach sie schon zwei Grundsätze aus. Erstens, sie wollte eine wahrhaftige Weltanschauungspartei sein. Und zweitens, sie wollte daher kompromisslos die einzige Macht und alleinige Macht in Deutschland. A mesmerizing speaker, it was with words that Hitler transformed Germany from a republic to a brutal dictatorship. It was with words that he led his country down the path to war. It is through the records of his speeches and conversations that we must seek to understand him. Hitler was born in the small town of Braunau, just inside the Austrian border with Germany, on April the 20th, 1889. He was the fourth child of Clara, whose first three children had not survived beyond infancy. As a result, Hitler's mother was utterly devoted, lavishing him with care and attention. The young Adolf was a restless, lazy, unhappy child, always at odds with his strict authoritarian father, Alois, a minor civil servant. At the back of his mind, he had the idea that his son should become a government official. But it nauseated me to think that one day I might be fettered to an office stool. I used to say to my father, Father, just think. And he would immediately interrupt me, My son. I have no need to think. I am a public official. School was ridiculously easy. What gave me pleasure, I learned. What seemed unimportant, I sabotaged completely. By far my best subjects were geography and history. I always had the best marks. On the other hand, I had less impeccable behavior. I became a little ringleader that was hard to handle. In fact, Hitler's conduct was perfectly satisfactory, but he was never much of a student. His grades were so bad that he was forced to leave school at age 16. As always, Hitler's memory was highly selective.
Contrary to his father's wishes, Hitler insisted he wanted to become an artist. When his father died in 1905, Hitler's indulgent mother allowed him to move to Vienna to make application to the National Arts Academy. But while his work was competent, even interesting, it did not impress the Academy's Board of Governors, and his application was rejected. For me, Vienna represents five years of hardship and misery. Years in which I was forced to earn my living, first as a day laborer and then as a painter. I had no other friends than care and everlasting hunger. Despite my dubious surroundings, I always preserved my good name. Hitler drifted from one flop house to another without friends or interests, living on a small orphan's pension and what money his mother could send him. He occupied his time seeking out amateur political theorists and social malcontents like himself. He grew intolerant, hating smoking and drinking, Marxists, military officers, the educational system that had rejected him, and the Jews. I did not come across the word Jew with any frequency until it was in connection with political discussions. The fact that Jews had been persecuted turned my distaste of unfavorable remarks about them into horror. Then, one day, as I was strolling through the inner city of Vienna, I encountered an apparition in black kaftan and black hair locks. Is this a Jew? To be sure, they had not looked like this in Linz. I bought my first anti-Semitic pamphlet, but the accusation seemed so monstrous. Then, wherever I went, I began to see Jews. And the more I saw them, the more they became distinguished from the rest of humanity. My ideas with regard to anti-Semitism was the greatest transformation of all. I no longer avoided discussion of the Jewish question. Now I sought it. Gradually I began to hate them. I had ceased to be a weak-kneed cosmopolitan and became an anti-Semite. I had come to Vienna to observe three important problems. The social question, the race problem, and finally, the Marxist movement. I left Vienna a confirmed anti-Semite, a deadly foe of Marxists, and pro-German in my politics. Since then, I've had to learn little and have altered nothing. By his own admission, age 23, Hitler had learned all he ever needed to know. When World War I swept through Europe, Hitler seized the opportunity to escape his miserable, pointless life. Since I knew the destiny of Germany-Austria would not be fought in the Austrian army alone, I enlisted in the German army. The change seemed to agree with him. The struggle of the year 1914 came like a redemption from the vexations of my youth. To this day, I am not ashamed to say that I sank down on my knees and thanked heaven from an overflowing heart. Serving as a company messenger, Private, later Corporal Hitler, took part in 48 battles, was wounded twice, and received the Iron Cross First Class for bravery under fire. Hitler did not, however, make any friends. Brooding in the trenches, he would fly into rages, ranting to his fellow soldiers about the communists and Jews. In October 1918, he was temporarily blinded in a gas attack.
One month later, as he lay in a darkened hospital room, a greater darkness descended across Germany. The war was lost. At the end of the war, many of Europe's great monarchies disintegrated. In their place came anarchy, military collapse, and social breakdown. Germany teetered on the brink. Swathes of border territories were confiscated by foreign powers. The country was stripped of its military and crippled by war debts. Communists, monarchists, and the unemployed took to the streets. Germany was plunging toward anarchy. Hitler, still technically in the army, was assigned to spy on the more dissident groups. One of them, calling itself the German Workers' Party, had only 25 members, but it captured his attention. This absurd little organization with its few members seemed to possess the advantage that it left the individual an opportunity for real personal activity. The smaller the movement, the more readily it could be put into proper form. Hitler joined the group and in less than six months became its primary spokesman, where his natural gift for public speaking drew ever larger crowds. By early 1920, it was attracting a thousand people. Within a year, Hitler had imposed himself as chairman of the group and changed its name to the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or NSDAP, commonly called the Nazis. He also adopted the swastika as the party emblem. I remember in 1923, the first time I spoke in a hall that could hold more than 2,000 people. I told them, in the masses, a great energy is slumbering and it only awaits the man who will summon it from its slumber and hurl it into the great battle for the destiny of the German race. Only months later, the German economy finally collapsed. Inflation soared. It became cheaper to burn paper money than buy firewood. The misery of our people is horrible to behold. Millions are unemployed and starving. The whole middle class has been impoverished. When this collapse finally reaches the German peasant, we will be faced with an immeasurable disaster. To unemployed workers, Hitler preached the evils of capitalism, while to capitalists, he insisted he was anti-communist. At all our meetings, I had party members in the audience with orders to interrupt along carefully prepared lines to give the impression of a spontaneous expression of public opinion. These interruptions strengthened the force of my arguments. Hitler also organized a motley crew of street thugs and bullies he called the SA, or brown shirts. My shock troops, those jolly rogues, with what confidence they followed me. They gave themselves body and soul, ready to break up communist meetings. I ordered them to treat our opponents roughly and chuck them out of our meetings. I disorganized the meetings of other parties by sending members of our party in the disguise of ushers, but in reality with instructions to riot and break up the meetings. As for their assumed brutality, they were simply somewhat close to nature. Through all the centuries, force and power are the determining factors. Only force rules. Force is the first law. If you wish to lead a people successfully through a difficult period of history, you must have no doubt that any individual who either actively or passively excludes himself from the activities of the community must be destroyed. Extremes must be fought with extremes. 
we must be, on principle, the most fanatical nationalists. A nation's economic life depends on the strength of a national state. It does not depend on such phrases as freedom of the people. We have no scruples, no bourgeois hesitations. They regard me as an uneducated barbarian. Yes, we are barbarians. We want to be barbarians. It is an honorable title. In 1923, Hitler and his barbarians finally saw a chance to flex their growing political muscle. 3,000 Nazi party members swarmed through the streets of Munich, attempting to overthrow the Bavarian government. They believed the police would cooperate, but instead they machine-gunned the Nazi column, killing 16. Three days later, 34-year-old Adolf Hitler was arrested and charged with treason. Sentenced to five years in prison, Hitler spent his time dictating his memoirs to loyal acolyte Rudolf Hess. Mein Kampf, or My Struggle, was a long, rambling diatribe against Hitler's favorite targets. The Jews, foreigners of every type, and communists. Hitler was incarcerated for just 11 months, but it was enough for him to change his mind about revolutionary politics. Instead of working to achieve power by an armed coup, we shall have to hold our noses and enter the government. If outvoting them takes longer than outshooting them, at least the results will be guaranteed by their own constitution. Sooner or later, we shall have a majority. And after that, we will have Germany. Thanks to Hitler's fiery rhetoric, the party's new populist tactics and the ever-deepening German economic crisis, Nazi party membership swelled from 27,000 in 1924 to nearly 180,000 four years later. In 1928, the Nazis won 12 seats in the German National Assembly. Two years later, they were the second most powerful party in Germany. For us, Winning seats in Parliament is not an end to itself, but only a means to an end. We are not, on principle, a parliamentary party. That would be a contradiction to our whole outlook. The party must not rust away in Parliament. It must not spend itself in superfluous battles of words. But the banner, with the white circle and the black swastika, will be hoisted over the whole of Germany on the day which shall mark the liberation of our people. In the 1932 presidential election, Hitler ran against the aging German president and World War I hero, Field Marshal von Hindenburg. One way or the other, if the election does not decide, the decision must be brought about by other means. Hitler lost the bid for president, but by now the Nazis had become the largest party in Germany. But Hitler had no intention of cooperating with other political parties. And in an attempt to control Nazi violence, Hindenburg appointed Hitler Chancellor. Within six months, Hitler was virtually ruling the country, completely ignoring the 85-year-old Hindenburg. When Hindenburg died the following August, the office of president and that of chancellor were incorporated into the single office of leader, Führer in German. Ha-ha, what a happy inspiration I had in refusing the title of president of the Reich. Can you imagine it? President Adolf Hitler, there is no finer title than Führer. Now, if anyone tries to impose conditions on me, I shall say to him, just wait and see what conditions I impose on you. I alone lead the movement. No one imposes conditions on me. It had taken just 10 years for Hitler to rise from a petty political agitator to absolute master of Germany. In 
In spite of his ability to dominate huge crowds, Adolf Hitler was awkward around individuals and was never able to form lasting friendships. To many, it seemed that the Führer only found self-confidence behind a podium. At formal occasions, he fidgeted constantly, tugging at his clothes and wringing his hands. To disguise his awkwardness, Hitler often resorted to being rude. On one occasion, an admirer asked the Führer how he greeted foreign ambassadors at a reception. It is very simple. I look him straight in the eyes until he loses his composure. Then I ask, does the Berlin climate agree with your excellency? And while he stammers an answer, I've already moved on to the next person. Hitler, however, was particularly fond of women, and they of him. They rhapsodized over his blue eyes. What lovely women there are in the world. My particular tragedy is that as head of state, I always have the most worthy ladies as my dinner partner. I'd rather go and pick up some pretty little typist or sales girl. The greater the man, the less important the woman. Still, Hitler insisted that women should be respected. The state of society in which women were regarded merely as slaves would be a clear regression for humanity. In prehistoric times, matriarchy was a fairly widespread form of social organization. But Hitler had his limits. I detest women who dabble in politics, and if their dabbling extends to military matters, it becomes utterly unendurable. In no section of the Nazi party has a woman ever had the right to hold even the smallest post. A girl's object should be to get married. Nature wants a woman to be fertile. Many women go slightly off their heads when they don't bear children. It is a thousand times better that she should have a child and thus a reason to exist. Most of the women in Hitler's life came from backgrounds as humble as his own. Hitler's only long-term companion was Eva Braun. She was a pretty young sales clerk who would remain utterly devoted to the very end when she became Hitler's wife. Curiously, Adolf Hitler seemed genuinely fond of children. He thoroughly enjoyed their company and was an adept storyteller, mimicking the voices of one character after another to the delight of his diminutive audience. But delightful as they were, Children, too, had a greater purpose in Hitler's Germany. The Hitler Youth was an organization modeled on the Scout Movement. But Hitler Youth were taught to throw hand grenades and swear undying allegiance to their Führer and the Nazi Party. I am very pleased to see how we bind the youth of German land with ever closer bonds to National Socialism and the German way of thought. Anyone who knows the soul of youth will understand that it is they who lend an ear most joyfully to the battle cry. Youth go on working and working for an idea, regardless of anything the older generation does to stop them.
With his harsh, grating voice and gift for self-dramatization, Hitler was able to exercise an almost hypnotic effect over vast crowds of people. But his success wasn't down to just technique. It was what he said. Like many political leaders before and since, Hitler found that a fast, effective way to unite people was to find a common enemy. The function of propaganda is not to ponder the rights of different people. Its task is to serve our own right, always and unflinchingly. The leader of genius must have the ability to make different opponents appear as if they belong to one category. Improvements of any kind whatsoever absolutely must be supplemented with a struggle against some social class or caste. My objective is to create revolutionary upheavals, regardless of what methods I have to use in the process. With this in mind, I had to find the right kind of victim. I examined every possible solution and came to the conclusion that a campaign against the Jews would be as popular as it would be successful. They are totally defenseless and no one will stand up to protect them. Und so lange auch nur einer von uns atmen kann, wird er diese Bewegung seine Kräfte leihen und für sie eintreten, so wie in den Jahren, die hinter uns liegen. Dann wird vor Trommel mit Trommel kommen, zur Fahne die Fahne, dann wird zur Gruppe Gruppe stoßen, zum Gau der Gau, und dann wird endlich diese gewaltige Kolonne der geeinten Nation nachfolgen, das früher zerrissene Volk. Always beginning in hushed tones, Hitler's speeches built, in a matter of minutes, to fanatical tirades. Inevitably, when he reached this point, members of the audience began to faint. Pleased as he was with the results, Hitler despised the masses as sheep or cattle to be led blindly. All propaganda must be popular, and its intellectual level must be adjusted to the most limited intelligence. Consequently, the greater the mass it is to reach, the lower its intellectual level will have to be. Propaganda must avoid intellectual demands on the public. People need wholesome fear. They want to fear something. They want someone to frighten them and make them shudderingly submissive. Terror is absolutely indispensable in founding a new power. One of the secrets of Hitler's success was understanding that different audiences needed to hear very different things. And it wasn't just Germans that he became adept at manipulating. We must systematically draw all the Germanic people of Europe into the German channel of thought. But propaganda destined for abroad must not be based on that used for home consumption. Broadcasts to Britain, for example, must contain plenty of music of the type popular among the British. This way they will acquire the habit of listening to it more and more. As the old saying goes, little drops of water will wear away the stone. During the early years of his dictatorship, the image Hitler projected to the world beyond Germany was that of a reasonable man struggling to rebuild his shattered nation. In Germany, the people decide their own existence. They determine the principles of government. For the first time in German history, we have a state which has abolished absolutely all social prejudices. I state definitely that minorities who live in Germany are not persecuted. Class prejudices can't be maintained in a socially advanced state like ours. 
we favor the development of people of worth. The party should enable the poorest child to lay claim to the highest functions, if he has the talent. Our duty is to teach men to see whatever is lovely and truly wonderful in life, and not become ill-tempered and spiteful. Enjoy what is beautiful and avoid anything that might do harm to people like ourselves. Hitler told the world exactly what it wanted to hear. I don't want to force national socialism on anybody. If I'm told that some countries want to remain democracies, very well, they must remain democracies at all costs. The national government is impressed with its duty to use equal rights as an instrument to secure and maintain the peace which the world requires today more than ever before. My party comrades will not fail to understand me when they hear me speak of universal peace, disarmament and mutual security pacts. Hitler's cynical platitudes were lapped up by nations refusing to face their worst fears. But Hitler's party comrades were well aware of what Hitler really thought. According to the Americans themselves, America has the finest, biggest, and most efficient of everything in the world. They have the brains of a hen. Well, the disillusionment will be all the more severe when their house of cards collapses. The British have no conception of chivalry in war. They are realists, devoid of any scruples and cold as ice. The German is always restrained by moral scruples. The rulers of present-day Russia are common criminals. The scum of humanity, which has wiped out thousands in a wild bloodlust. Do not forget that the international Jew completely dominates Russia. Still, in his own way, Stalin is a hell of a fellow. Hitler's venom even extended to his few allies. The touchiness of the Italians comes from an inferiority complex it is the touchiness of a people with a guilty conscience. Hitler's bigotry wasn't restricted by mere nationality. Religion was a favorite target. Christianity is the invention of sick brains. It promulgates inconsistent dogmas and imposes them by force. The mere sight of one of these abortions in a cassock makes me wild. For Hitler, the German people were special. The German people have made moral law the governing principle of all action. We Germans have that marvelous sense of duty which other people lack. The Germans are the highest species of humanity on earth. Hitler swore to his people that he would make their nation the hub of Europe. Germanic people must compose the nucleus around which all Europe will federate. When we have solidly organized Europe, who knows, perhaps one day we shall be able to entertain other ambitions. In fact, Hitler entertained other ambitions from the earliest days. Never consider the Reich secure unless it is in a position to give every one of its descendants a piece of ground that he can call his own. To guarantee living space for the German people, we are bound to think first of Russia and her border states. Circumstance must be adapted to aims. This is impossible without the invasion of foreign states or attacks upon foreign property. My long-term policy aims at having a hundred million Germans settle in the conquered territories. 
German colonists in our new eastern colonies ought to live on handsome, spacious farms. Beyond that would be another world where the Russians can live as they like. I absolutely forbid the organization of any sort of hygiene or cleanliness in these countries. No vaccinations and no soap to get the dirt off them. This would only result in an increase in the local population. But let them have all the vodka and tobacco they want. Unfortunately for history, Hitler was no mere idle procrastinator. As soon as he took power, he turned his words into action and the world was changed forever. Germany can only be saved through action. A government needs power. It needs strength. It must, with brutal righteousness, press through the ideas which it recognizes to be right. Democracy is fundamentally not German, it is Jewish. This Jewish democracy with its majority decisions has always been a means towards the destruction of Aryan leadership. Restrictions on personal liberty, on the right of free expression and the right of assembly are permissible beyond the legal limit. Nature is cruel, therefore we have the right to be cruel. When I send the flower of German youth into the steel hail of the next war, without feeling the slightest regret over the precious German blood that's being spilled, should I not also have the right to eliminate millions of an inferior race that multiplies like vermin? In 1933, as soon as he became Chancellor, Hitler began stripping away individual rights Jews were denied any role in political life, stripped of their citizenship, and denied the right to do business or hold a job. It is beside the point whether the individual Jew is decent or not. My first task will be the annihilation of the Jews. I will have gallows built in rows. Jews will be hanged indiscriminately, and they will remain hanging until they stink. As soon as they've been untied, the next batch will be strung up until the last Jew has been exterminated. It is a shameful spectacle to see how the whole democratic world is oozing sympathy for the poor, tormented Jewish people. If Hitler was to have any chance of defying the world and creating a Third Reich that his beloved German people deserved, he would first need to rebuild the economy and then rearm. No economic policy is possible without a sword. No industrialization without power. Today we no longer have a sword grasped in our fist, so how can we have a successful economic policy? As much as he hated other countries, he was not above holding up their successes as an example of what Germany might become. In America, everything is machine-made, so their workers need no specialized training, and they're therefore interchangeable. In this respect, we are far behind the Americans. To help lift Germany out of the depression and demonstrate his interest in the German people, 
Hitler undertook a massive public works project to construct 1,500 miles of new highways and a scheme to provide inexpensive automobiles. The first German automobile of this sort will be the Volkswagen. It is the car of the future. Cheap cars were the least of Germany's problems. It lacked nearly every natural resource required by heavy industry. To obtain natural wealth meant taking it from someone else by force. Originally, war was a struggle for pasture land. Today, it is a struggle for the riches of nature. By virtue of inherent law, these riches belong to him who conquers them. The law of natural selection justifies this incessant struggle by allowing the survival of the fittest. Hitler began rearming his country in open defiance of the Treaty of Versailles, which had disarmed Germany at the end of the First World War. In 1934, the German army contained 100,000 men, no tanks, no airplanes, and very little artillery. Within five years, Hitler had expanded the military from eight divisions to 38, with a total of over four million men. Hitler constantly exaggerated Germany's military strength, as if defying someone to stop him. What the world shuts its ears to today, it will not be able to ignore in a year's time. Despite his threats and posturing, Hitler knew Germany could not survive a prolonged war. Its limited natural resources and the threat of a naval blockade imposed by Britain demanded something new, something that would be fast and devastatingly effective. In war, the soldier who achieves the greatest success is the one who has the most modern technical means at his disposal, not only in battle itself, but also in the field of communications and supply. The important thing is to have technical superiority in every case. We must meet the enemy with novelties that take him by surprise so we can continually retain the initiative. This new, highly mobile and technologically advanced army would engage the enemy in a series of fast, hard-hitting strikes designed to take the opposition off guard and keep them that way. This was the basic theory of what Hitler called Blitzkrieg, the lightning war. And if it worked the first time, Hitler saw no reason why it should not work indefinitely. We will always strike first. We will always deliver the first blow. I shall shrink from nothing. Nothing will prevent me from making use of any advantage. The next war will be unbelievably bloody and grim. It will make no distinction between military and civilian combatants. Germany is entirely ready to renounce all offensive weapons. Germany is prepared to agree to any solemn pact of non-aggression. As a strong state, we are ready to embark on a policy of understanding with the world around us. We want nothing from others. We have no wishes or demands. We want peace. While Hitler talked peace, the army prepared war. On February the 27th, 1936, German forces entered the Rhineland, 
Germany's former industrial heartland, which had been divided between France and Belgium after the Great War. Again, Hitler spoke to the world and awaited Europe's reaction. Now that complete German sovereignty and equality have been restored to the Rhineland, with all my heart I hope that the intelligence and goodwill of responsible European governments will succeed in preserving peace for Europe. Peace is our dearest treasure. France, Belgium and Great Britain did nothing. Privately, Hitler was deeply relieved. The 48 hours after the march into the Rhineland were the most nerve-wracking in my life. If the French had marched into the Rhineland, we would have had to withdraw with our tails between our legs. The military resources at our disposal would have been wholly inadequate for even moderate resistance. To celebrate their first major victory, Hitler and the Nazi party held a massive rally in the city of Nuremberg where Hitler gloated over the annexation of the Rhineland. Abroad, perhaps, we are not loved, but we are respected and we receive attention. That is the important thing. Above all, we have given the greatest possible good fortune to millions of our fellow citizens. Their return to our greater German Reich. Hitler now set his sights on his homeland, the ruins of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Rudderless since its collapse in 1918, Austria was largely Germanic in culture and language. German Austria must return to the great German mother country, not because of any economic constraints, but because one blood demands one Reich. A few carefully engineered assassinations Intense political pressure and thinly veiled threats all helped convince the Austrian government that it should surrender itself to Germany. On March the 11th, 1938, German troops rolled across the border. Once again, Hitler's Reich had been expanded without a shot being fired. Gambling that virtually no amount of aggression would rouse England and France Hitler began publicly agitating for his next conquest, the Sudetenland. 42,000 square miles of former German territory ceded to Czechoslovakia at the end of World War I. Once the Sudeten problem is settled, it will be the last territorial demand I have to make in Europe. I hope that in a few days the problem will finally be solved and we shall have occupied all the areas which belong to us. Thus, one of Europe's most serious crises will be ended. I realize vividly how Herr Hitler feels that he must champion other Germans. He told me privately, and last night he repeated publicly, that after the Sudeten German question is settled, that is the end of Germany's territorial claims in Europe. The British and French governments believed Hitler and in late 1938 signed a peace agreement in Munich allowing Germany to take the Sudetenland and guaranteeing Czechoslovakia against further losses. While all Europe celebrated what the British Prime Minister called peace in our time, Hitler was candid with his inner circle. It is my unalterable decision to smash Czechoslovakia by military action in the near future. The Czechs are inferior. 
It is enough for a Czech to grow a moustache for anyone to see from the way the thing droops that his origin is Mongol. But Hitler remained cautious. I will take action against Czechoslovakia only if I am convinced that France, and therefore England, will not intervene. In March 1939, only 13 months after Germany annexed the first of its lost territories, a terrified Czechoslovakia surrendered to Nazi Germany without military action. Hitler's public announcement was short and to the point. Czechoslovakia has ceased to exist. Hitler's seizure of Czechoslovakia just four months after guaranteeing its safety was not the last treaty Hitler would discard that year. Flushed with success and the refusal of Czechoslovakia's allies to come to her aid, Hitler immediately set his sights on neighboring Poland, with whom he had signed a non-aggression pact five years earlier. But long before Hitler signed his pact with the Poles, he had harbored a seething hatred for Polish people. The Poles are especially born for hard labor. The people should be used by us merely as a source of unskilled labor. There should be only one master for the Pole, the Germans. All representatives of the Polish intelligentsia are to be exterminated. I would like to kill without mercy all men, women, and children of the Polish race or who speak the Polish language. Adolf Hitler was about to open the gates of hell. <laughs> 